Hello, thanks for joining us. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, welcome to our webinar on regional finance and governance models for watershed management. My name is Tess Clark. I work here at the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. We will be getting started in just a minute, but first there are a few logistical items that I wanted to mention. First, everyone will be on mute to ensure audio quality. If you have a question, just type it into the GoToWebinar question dialog box anytime throughout the session. All of the questions will be reserved for a Q&A at the end, but please feel free to send questions at any time. We will be making today's slides available as well as a video recording on the EFCN website. You can reach that website at www.efcnetwork.org. All of our webinars can be found under the Past Events tab, and we also send out a link to the recording via email. As a courtesy, we provide a certificate of attendance for participating in our webinars. We do not submit our webinars to licensing agencies for pre-approval of continuing education credits, and you must attend the entire 60-minute session to receive one. You need to access the webinar according to the GoToWebinar instructions in your confirmation email. Again, we can't guarantee that our webinars will meet the criteria for CEUs for any given agency. Uh, finally, certificates will be sent via email within the next 30 days. Now for a little bit about us. The Environmental Finance Center Network provides training and technical assistance to small public water systems in all U.S. states and territories to help local water systems achieve their goals and stay in compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. As you might guess from our name, the EFCN is a university-based network. You can see a list of all of our network members here, uh, and our job is to work together to create solutions to difficult how-to-pay issues of environmental protection and improvement. On that note, I'd like to introduce Evan Kirk, Project Director at the UNC Environmental Finance Center. In his current role as Project Director, Evan conducts applied research on water, wastewater, and stormwater finance topics, and administers technical assistance and trainings for small systems. So welcome, Evan. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. I am going to make you a presenter. Thank you, Tess, and thank you, everybody, for your interest in this topic. And sitting in on the webinar today. Um, so again, the topic of the webinar is regional finance and governance models for source water, uh, watershed management. Um, so quickly go over the, um, <clears throat> show my screen here, and quickly go over the webinar object objectives. So today we're gonna cover what is watershed management? Um, how do small systems benefit from watershed management? and how can small systems participate in watershed management? So just quickly to get a feel of who's in the audience and uh, what their roles are, we're gonna have a couple of polling questions. Um, so we'll start off uh, here, and I think Tess is gonna read polling questions for us. Yep, absolutely. So the first question is, which best describes where your water utility gets its source water? So you can click every option that applies to you here. First, uh, purchase sur surface water, uh, purchasing groundwater, uh, just groundwater, or just surface water, or also not a utility. So it looks like we're getting a good number of responses. 73% uh, of people have voted, so we're going to give you maybe two or three more seconds just to get your response in, and then we'll share the results. Okay, so I'm going to close this poll in three, two, and one. Okay. And in terms of results, it looks like of our systems today, the majority are using surface water, 33%. 19% um, say they have groundwater. Uh, and equal parts, 5% and 5% purchase surface water and groundwater. And again, this was a, a click all that apply question, so there could be multiple sources here. Okay, uh, great. Um, next polling question here. All right, so the second question is, does your utility experience water quality challenges in your source water? So you can tell us yes, no, I don't know, or not a utility. We'll just give you maybe three or four more seconds to uh, submit your response. Looks like almost everyone has submitted a response, so I'm gonna close this poll in three, two, and one. And in terms of our results, um, well, of our systems, the majority do uh, 
experience water quality challenges in your source water with 24% responding yes. 15% um, said no, and there's a small number of folks, 3%, that don't know. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and the final polling question here at the beginning of the webinar um, is now up. Okay. So finally, we want to know all the ways that your utility has acted to protect your source water. So you can tell us all the things that you've done off of this list. So that includes education, partnerships, land conservation, project implementation, and watershed planning. So if you've participated in any or all of those things, you can let us know here. Looks like a couple people are still putting in their response. It takes a little bit more thought, this one. So we're going to give you uh, three more seconds. So I'm going to close this poll in three, two, and one. All right. Wow, so it looks like a lot of people have participated in some form of educational program, 69%, and then 63% have some sort of watershed planning experience as well. Um, land conservation is the least uh, selected option with 24%, and then sort of evenly split with partnership and project implementation. It's around 50% there. Okay, well, um, that's great. So. We're going to move forward a little bit. I'm going to circle back and discuss a little bit the results of those polling questions. Um, some of them are pretty, pretty good results. We see that most of you are surface water um, at, at some point in your sourcing. You may have other sources as well. Um, some of you purchase surface water. And certainly groundwater also has some challenges with water quality that can be related to watershed management. Um, but we're going to move forward here. Um, as we recall, the objectives were first to describe what watershed management is, and so here I have a definition for you. Um, watershed management, uh, whoops, I jumped ahead one slide here. So it's any program or collection of strategies that positively influence activities and land characteristics within a drainage basin. Um, and more specifically, um, I wanted to make this webinar uh, applicable to small systems across the country. So. Um, we are going to define as well what source water protection is. Um, source water protection is a subcomponent of watershed management. So it's watershed management for the purpose of preserving the water quality of a drinking water supply. <clears throat> so going along the lines of making sure that this is applicable to small systems, um, I wanted to highlight quickly some unique challenges that small systems face in the area of source water protection. And the first one, um, is that small systems often rely on other sources of water. Uh, this is getting at the fact that many small systems may purchase their water from larger systems. Um, and the larger systems may be more likely to have surface water as a source. Uh, so those might be the areas in which uh, watershed management may be most critical. Um, so we're going to get into a little bit about how small systems may be able to collaborate with larger systems or with other entities when they don't have total control over the, the land use within a watershed. So again, um, small systems have limited technical and financial resources. Um, so that's where the collaboration also becomes really important. And then they have limited ability to impact land use in the entire watershed. Their jurisdiction um, of the municipality or county that they may be a part of, or even if they're a private system, they may not have the ability to control the land use or to impact the land use in the entire watershed that feeds their water source. So that's where collaboration becomes key. <clears throat> so um, EPA has a really good website that um, I'm gonna show you a link to at the end, but they outline the steps of source water protection um, so there are six steps that they identify. Um, so the first step is to delineate your source water protection area. Um, that's to identify the watershed that feeds your water source. Uh, to inventory known and potential sources of contamination. To determine the susceptibility of the public water system to contaminant sources. Uh, to notify the public of threats. To implement management measures to prevent, reduce, or eliminate risks to source water and to develop contingency planning strategies. So I'm gonna go into the specifics of each one of these steps really quickly. So the first one, to delineate source water protection area. 
Uh, that's simply to answer the question, what is the watershed boundary or groundwater recharge area of your drinking water source? Um, so that one's pretty intuitive. I think that the next ones may need slightly more explanation. Um, so to inventory known and potential sources of contamination, and this one can be a little bit complicated because as m many people may know, the potential sources of contamination may be both point source and non-point source. And the non-point source may be more difficult to both identify and to regulate. So determine the susceptibility of the public drinking water system to contaminant sources. Uh, so this in includes determining the nature of the threat. Um, that kind of goes into classifying it as point source, non-point source, hazardous, non-hazardous. Maybe it's a nutrient or a mineral pollution. Um, maybe it's a heat pollution from a power plant or from another source. Um, also identifying the severity of the potential contamination um, and then the likelihood of contamination. And this is very similar to a risk uh, analysis where you may be able to pr prioritize um, addressing these contaminants based off of how severe, what nature they are and how likely it is to occur. The next step is to notify the public of threats. So one that we all are familiar with is a boil water advisory. There may be other uh, notification strategies that you may have. Um, for instance, you may notify um, potential threats within board meetings. Um, you may notify uh, through newspaper clippings, et cetera. Um, but the, the most serious one and the most, uh, most well-known is a boil water advisory. Um, the next step is to implement management measures. Um, and so these are measures specific to each threat and to each watershed. So management measures that one utility may implement may not be the same as um, what management measures another utility may implement. So for instance, if your watershed is forested, you may have very different management strategies than a uh, watershed that's non-forested or that's urbanized. Uh, moving forward to the next step here, um, develop contingency planning strategies. So you need to make sure that there's a backup water supply for sh both short-term term and long-term disruptions. Um, and these may include utility-owned sources or simply interconnecting with neighboring systems. And when you interconnect with neighboring systems, whether or not you have an interlocal agreement in place that's either verbal or on paper um, is very important. So I'm gonna move forward into how small systems benefit from watershed management. Um, so it's a little bit less technical and more about why, why many of you may be here and what may interest you from this webinar. So the first one, and I think the biggest one here, is avoided costs. Um, one, one cost that's very, uh, very important for source water is the, the dirtier the source water, the more contaminated, the more it costs to treat that source water, uh, to bring it up to drinking water standards. So you're going to experience a reduction or rather an avoided cost of water treatment. And then you may also have uh, avoided capital improvements. Um, I think that if, you, if source water is protected, then you may have to not implement some best available techno technology for uh, water treatment. You may avoid having to implement more expensive filters or reverse osmosis. You're going to reduce the number of violations that occur. Um, this certainly doesn't stop a utility from having any notification violations, but they, it may uh, reduce the instances of violations from contaminants. And then I think a big one here is the cost to earn your customer trust back. So here's a headline here. Um, as Tess said, I am located at the University of North Carolina, and in North Carolina we have issues with emergent contaminants. and along the lines of uh, those emerging contaminants becoming, uh, the public becoming aware of those is a big uh, lack of public trust in their drinking water source. So here's a headline saying, murky waters, North Carolina residents unaware of possible water contamination. And customer trust, it's, it's something that's pretty finicky. Um, the media is it's always looking for stories about contamination. Uh, it certainly, as soon as you lose your customer trust, it's very difficult to win it back. So the best way to avoid that is to just try to prevent losing that trust in the first place. And uh, you, the customers like to see utilities being proactive. So if you're doing something about it, if you're being um, open about any potential problems, 
if you're communicating with the customers and keeping them involved in the process, then even if you do have issues with contaminants from time to time, they're going to be more trust. You're going to be you're going to have more trust from them um, in the process. So getting into a little bit of the ancillary benefits, um, there are benefits to land conservation. There are benefits to better water quality, and these include recreation benefits social benefits, economic benefits from uh, property tax values, public health benefits, and even resiliency benefits. You may be more resilient to natural disasters in the future. Um, here's a picture of University Lake. Uh, this is a location that I like to go to here in Chapel Hill. It's owned by the Orange County Water and Sewer Authority, um, and they allow uh, residents to go and canoe and to paddleboard within the reservoir. Um, the reservoir has uh, land use restrictions uh, within the entire watershed that feeds it. Um, there's an interlocal agreement between Owasa and the town of Chapel Hill that uh, has put in place zoning that is very low dense, uh, low density and is keeping the water quality of this reservoir pretty high. So the main point for ancillary benefits is that uh, from a pure economic standpoint, a small utility may not be able to implement source water management, uh, but the question is, why should they care about the ancillary benefits? It's, it's because uh, it helps drive customer involvement, and it also helps get partners involved with the watershed management, with the source water protection. Um, and with that collaboration with the partners, the, the utility, even if they're, they are small, may be able to better implement watershed management at any level. Um, so the big part about the ancillary benefits is it really gets people excited. Um, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, so a little bit more about the ancillary benefits and environmental benefits. Um, you're going to have more, perhaps more green space. You're going to have perhaps more compatible land uses with what the customers within the utility want. Um, and the environmental benefits are pretty self-explanatory. Um, in North Carolina, we deal a lot with nutrient pollution. Um, and so any sort of watershed protection or watershed management is going to be uh, something that's going to help us get, meet those goals of nutrient reduction. So the next one is emergency response coordination. If a water utility is already coordinated with local governments, maybe neighboring local governments, maybe uh, the county government of the county that they're a part of, um, and neighboring utilities, they're going to have pre-existing relationships that are going to better help emergency response. Um, and they may also have a more reliable backup source. So one, one concept that really does a nice job of describing what this whole watershed management uh, is getting at is one water. Um, so the one water approach is an approach that says that water in all forms is valuable and should be managed holistically. So um, it has six uh, pillars, reliable and resilient water utilities, thriving cities, competitive business and industry, sustainable agricultural systems, social and economic inclusion, and healthy waterways. So this one water approach really gets at the ancillary benefits that I had just described in the previous two slides. Um, and it's, it's something that more utilities are thinking about making sure that they're managing their water holistically. So then uh, the next point I wanted to make is how can small systems participate in watershed management? And so I'm going to go a little bit into the ways that they can participate and the ways that they can find funding. So the first way is collaboration with other entities. The next way is to participate in watershed plans where they exist. Educate customers. We saw that a lot of people in the poll indicated that education is a big thing that they already participate in. Um, encourage public participation. Transparently share information and be proactive. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit more into what collaboration is and give you an example. So here's uh, an example from West Virginia. Lewisburg uh, partners with the West Virginia Land Trust. Um, and in that partnership, they've identified critical parcels for source water protection. Um, <clears throat> they did this through a stakeholder engagement process. So that's to get in the public involved. And I wanted to show, to provide a little bit of inspiration for all the small systems out there that Lewisburg serves about 10,000 customers. And it also sells water to another small system that serves 2,000 customers. So they've partnered with this land trust in order to do something that they perhaps wouldn't have been able to do on their own. 
Um, and that's, that's where the part partnership becomes really important. Got an example of education. Um, if any of you were involved in the webinar that we had last year um, with, with Portland, Maine, um, there's an initiative called the Waterways um, Education Program that in, in the Portland schools, um, they've been instituting this water, water source protection education program for the past 20 years. And that program now reaches over 1,000 students nine months out of the year. Um, and it's a hands-on teaching program about source water protection. So that's a really great program. Um, Portland is not a small system, so small systems may be able to institute a similar program, but maybe at a smaller scale. But it's having a big impact getting people thinking from a young age about source water protection and what they can do. I've got another example of a different type of education. Um, the first one was school, so it would be educating children. The second one is customer education, so um, social media engagement and just getting uh, at the people who are actually paying the bill and who are, aren't in school any longer. Um, so I'm going to try to play this video here. Um, this is from the town of Bradford in Ontario, Canada. So this, this is an example from an international example, but I thought this video was very short and to the point, um, and it uses a lot of good visuals for educating the public about what, what water source protection is. So let's let's hope this works here. Hello, I'm Claire, a risk management official working in the South Georgian Bay Lakes and Coast Source Protection Region, one of 19 source protection regions. I'm here to explain how we're working together to keep your drinking water clean. To begin with, you should know that your municipal drinking water is already safe and reliable. It's been monitored, analyzed, and treated to ensure that it's clean and ready to drink. But you should also know that your behavior impacts on the cost of providing safe drinking water to your community. The fewer pollutants that enter our lakes, rivers before they reach the treatment is for our communities and for the planet. The passing of the Provincial Clean Water Act in 2006 gave your local municipality added responsibility for protecting drinking water sources against a variety of threats like fuel, pesticides, and chemicals to poorly maintained septic systems. Local source protection plans detail what measures need to be taken to protect your the most vulnerable areas or municipal water and operate near these critical areas have a special responsibility when it comes to protecting our water concept, but it also means that you or business to learn more, go to ourwatershed.ca. And remember, a clean glass of water starts way before you turn on the tap. Um, so that was a great example of a simple video that uses nice visuals in order to engage with the public, and this was posted on social media. Um, it's a good way to very inexpensively interact with the customers and, and just have a positive influence on, on their way of thinking when it comes to their daily actions uh, for source water protection. Um, so moving forward to another polling question here, um, and I'll let Tess read it for us. All right, so the fourth polling question I'm about to launch is, are you or the utilities that you work with involved in a significant watershed protection partnership? So here you can tell us yes, no, maybe if you're not quite sure, or if you're not a water system, you can let us know that as well. So I'm gonna give you maybe five more seconds just to get your response in so we can keep this rolling along. And it looks like most people are responding, so I'm going to close this poll in three, two, and one. And as for our results, it looks like 21% of folks said that yes, they are involved in a significant watershed protection partnership. 26%, which is a little bit more, a majority of folks in this case said no. 6% are maybe, and then we do have some people on today who are not from systems. So that's a, kind of an even split there. So that's good to know. Yeah, um, so that shows that there are already people that are being proactive uh, within the utility for water source protection. It also shows that there's nice opportunity out there for increased participation, for increased partnership for water source protection. So uh, I think the answer to that question was twofold um, and it's a, it's, it's a good, good mix there. Um, so 
going to move forward into um, the governance structures that may exist. Um, so I think one thing that I, one point that I wanted to make with this was um, going back to the specific challenges that small systems face for water source protection. Um, and that was the fact that water, small water systems have limited resources and capacity uh, for implementing water source protection. And so the main governance structures that I'm focusing on in this presentation are governance structures in which the utility can participate in something that already exists. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that a small system that may be having difficulty paying for capital improvements and making ends meet on a day-to-day -day basis should use their managerial capacity to implement something new. I'm suggesting that perhaps there might be room for that uh, small system to participate in something that already exists. So um, some of those items may be interlocal agreements, watershed districts and planning areas, regional partnerships, um, and river basin associations or compliance associations. And that last point is more towards systems that are also wastewater systems. Um, so going back a little bit to the collaboration um, that I talked about just real quick verbally here, um, the small water system should perhaps uh, work to identify nonprofits in the community um, and work with entities that are already there. Um, and that was with the ancillary benefits that they can offer for this water source protection that gets other people really excited about it. So more specifically about interlocal agreements. Inter there are interlocal agreements that we've identified across the country that deal with source protection, that deal with water quality monitoring, that deal with coordination between watershed plans, and that deal with partnership with other systems. And so interlocal agreements, um, as I alluded to earlier in the webinar, can be both formal and informal agreements. Um, and they may include land use agreements. They may include agreements about uh, water supply during emergency situations. Um, they may uh, deal with a number of different things. Um, and I'm going to mention some resources that um, if your utility is looking to uh, enter into a local agreement with neighboring jurisdictions or neighboring utilities, that there are resources out there uh, to help the utility make sure that they're covering all their bases when, when they're uh, moving into this uh, partnership. So um, a little bit more about what a water, water quality uh, monitoring interlocal agreement may entail, um, and that would be sharing the resource uh, sharing the capacity to uh, test for water quality contaminants, uh, test for other uh, other things that they may be regulatory, regulatorily mandated to test for anyway. Um, th th there's no reason why a small utility wouldn't be able to partner with neighboring small utilities to share the capacity to do that testing. Uh, coordination between watershed plans. Um, there may, they may be within um, a larger contributing area where there are other entities um, and other entities within that watershed um, area may may already have watershed plans or source water protection plans that um, if they're in the same contributing area, they can participate in that plan and they should make sure that, that their plan um, is, is synonymous, is, is, uh, there's a synergy between the plans rather than working against each other. Um, so if you can coordinate your planning coordinate your strategies with other plans, you may be able to save resources, but also make sure that your resources have the biggest impact possible. Uh, partnership, um, I already mentioned the water quality monitoring interlocal agreements, but you may be able to partner with, um, with other jurisdictions and not in our local agreement, but you may be able to partner with land trusts, uh, nonprofits, even for-profit entities to have a greater impact uh, moving forward. So. Here's uh, a guide that the EFC crafted this past year, um, crafting interlocal agreements, interlocal water and wastewater agreements. Um, so it's a tips guide that goes over, I think, over 20 um, items that uh, a utility or a local government may want to take into account before they enter into a local agreement and during the process of developing that interlocal agreement. So this is important because you want to make sure that the interlocal agreement, if it's written, is uh, thorough enough and covers any uh, contingencies, anything that may occur 
that make sure you're, you're protecting yourself and you're protecting your constituents and your customers. So please feel free to go to our website here and download that uh, interlocal agreement tips guide um, if, you're, if you feel that you're ready to move forward with an interlocal agreement with neighboring entities. Um, so some example of some regional partnerships that I identified here. So um, there are regional water source protection projects, um, there are monitoring partnerships, and there are shared source partnerships. So an example of a regional water, set, water source protection project uh, is this uh, East Molokai Watershed Partnership in Hawaii. Uh, this partnership includes um, funders, experts, a small water system, and the Nature Conservancy. There's both private um, and nonprofit entities uh, within this partnership, and it it it's just it's uh, it's an example of having a very diverse uh, range of stakeholders participating in the same goal um, that allows the the small watershed water excuse me water supply district that exists there to protect their source water without having to do it all on their own. Uh, the Catawba Watery Water Management Group is an example of a shared source partnership. Uh, so this, this specific uh, organization has members that pay water allocation fees to uh, one single fund, and part of that water allocation fee is a water uh, quality component, and they use that revenue in order to protect their source water. So if you are withdrawing from a reservoir where other individuals are withdrawing, you may be able to set up a partnership where part of the funds that um, that come from the source water purchase go towards protecting that source water that you're purchasing. So moving into some funding and financing, um, then I identified some funding that uh, is both federal and state. Um, so the first one is the Clean Water Safe, uh, excuse me, Clean Water State Revolving Fund. Um, the second one is the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. The third one is the 319 Grant Program. And then finally, there's the National Water Quality Initiative. So for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, the, the states are given money from the federal government and then the states administer the program. Um, specifically in North Carolina, it's the Department of Water Infrastructure that administers this program and we see that that money can be spent on um, initiatives that protect source water as well as initiatives for stormwater. Uh, the Drinking Water uh, State Revolving Fund is very similar. That one might be a little bit more infrastructure focused. Um, I have links to these that I'm going to include within the PDF that we're going to post on the website, so you're going to be able to go in and, and read a little bit more about them. Many of you may already be familiar with them. The 319 grant program, um, each state has a specific non-point source management plan that they implement, and then they're allocated funds from the EPA uh, to implement these plans. And these funds may be used to conduct water watershed restoration projects such as stormwater and agricultural best management practices um, for restoration of impaired streams. Um, <clears throat> the uh, National Water Quality Initiative is more targeted towards farmers and ranchers in high priority stream areas. Um, and again, I have links here that you can go in and find out more details about them. Um, the, the point of this webinar wasn't to go into uh, fine tooth comb details about these funding and financing mechanisms, it's just to introduce you to them um, and the governance structures that they may be part of. So um, next there's some pretty exciting wording within the 2018 Farm Bill that many people are still trying to figure out how to tap into these resources, but um, the, the American Water Works Association wrote a nice blog about this that I've linked um, later in this presentation. They're, they're describing the fact that 10% of the $4 billion that's been mandated for conservation programs within the 2018 Farm Bill are earmarked for uh, conservation programs that protect source water. Uh, so that's, that's going to have some pretty significant influence on some good water quality initiatives. And then uh, the great part about this is it's going back towards the collaboration that I keep coming back to. Um, so collaboration between private landowners, conservation organizations, and state and local government um, is a big part of this funding program. 
So there's a really great guide um, here that I found from the EPA on the same source that describes the source water protection steps. Um, so there's funding, federal funding opportunities that are administered by the EPA, by the USDA, um, and by other federal agencies that uh, local governments, um, water utilities can use to implement water quality initiatives on a local level. Um, so I'm going to have these sources on the uh, PDF that we post on the website. Um, but the first one is the EPA source water protection um, that goes over the, the um, steps that I alluded to at the beginning. Um, and then there are certain partners that you can work with to protect water quality. Uh, there's water management uh, for potable water supply, another link that I found. And then there's the Farm Bill Fund for Water Source Protection, which links to the AWWA blog that I just talked about. Um, so I'm going to quickly go back to um, the list that describes the different ways that uh, <clears throat> that a water system can participate in source water protection. Um, excuse me here, I should have put that slide at the beginning too. Um, so I just wanted to go back and reiterate these points because I've gone through and described a little bit in detail about what many of them um, entail. So um, going back to the collaboration with other entities. Um, so again, identifying nonprofits, working with schools, um, participating in local events. Um, the Orange County Water and Sewer Authority is constantly at uh, the local farmer's market in Carborough and Chapel Hill to interact with customers and to just educate and, and be and put a face on the water utility. Um, many water utilities, they're just an abstract to the customer. They, they're they only known to them through the bill. Um, so if you can put a face on the utility, then there, you can develop that trust that's very key to having um, the ability to uh, keep that customer trust as well. So participating in the watershed plans, um, educating the customers, encouraging public participation, um, that's not only um, educating people through social media outreach, but that's also uh, making sure that the, the customers can feel like they're welcome at board meetings and they can voice their concerns um, and they can listen to the process that you have in your planning. Um, transparently share information. This may include a consumer confidence report that may already be mandated by regulation. Uh, make that readily available on your website. Um, be transparent with it. It would also be um, engagement with uh, maintenance that you may be doing on the system. You may want to let the customer know um, when you're maybe working on a water main or when you're maybe you're really excited about a water conservation project that you've been able to implement with a land trust and you're going to make sure that you're really um, engaging and making sure people know about the, the initiative that you have. And then being proactive. So if you know about a contamination, you've got to go ahead and share that. <clears throat> Even if the contamination is not something that's <clears throat> regulatorily mandated for you to share. And that's the problem that we're experiencing in North Carolina, excuse me, um, <clears throat> with the emerging contaminants. Okay, so that was a lot of information. Um, I'm going to move to one more polling question here um, that I'll allow Tess to read. And then we're going to move into some, a little bit early into some questions. Uh, and hopefully, um, I did end about 10 minutes earlier than I thought I was here, so hopefully we have some good questions that I can help engage with and, and answer. Great. So the final question is important. Um, the question is, would you like one-on-one -on -one assistance for funding source water protection? This is something that our uh, Smart Water Management for Small Water Systems program can provide you free if you are a small system. So if you'd like to know more, you can say yes, send me information about getting assistance, or you can say no. You can also say yes if you'd just like to know more about source water protection or if you'd like more resources or to talk with someone directly. Um, or if you know that you'd like to pursue some funding, we can help you identify those funding sources. So it looks like almost everyone has responded. I'm gonna give you a couple more seconds and then I'm gonna close the poll and we can get into some of these questions that we have. All right, I'm gonna close this now. Okay, um, so 
the first question that we got um, for you, Evan, is kind of in response to the picture of the lake from uh, the North Carolina Chapel Hill area lake that you brought up that has recreational uses. Okay. Um, and the question is, how do you protect the lake from the recreational uses, which may involve trash pickup or violations of rules of gas engines? And does that have any impact on cost and time, effort, or money uh, for that source water protection program? That's a really good question. Um, OWASA uh, does a really good job of setting expectations for recreational use ahead of time and strictly enforcing them from the get-go. Um, OWASA is, is a system that has uh, lots of resources and, and you know, to put it in a, in a term that, um, that is a little bit more, uh, I, I suppose, PC, but um, OWASA makes sure that you're not bringing in your own personal boat. So they have these uh, canoes and they have these paddle boats uh, that are owned by the utility itself that they do charge um, for the use of them. And so you're not allowed to bring in any gas motors. Um, they do have electric motors on some of the boats that you can rent. Um, they have signage uh, all along the inputs that show that um, you should be taking all trash with you. Um, but as far as the uh, added uh, cost of cleaning up trash that's not at the at the um, put-in point, um, I'm sure there is, there is um, an added cost to opening up a watershed in a lake to recreation that um, I'm not seeing at the input. But if, if you're developing, um, maybe you have a slight small source of revenue, um, <clears throat> like charging for the canoes, um, that may be something that could pay for itself. But also partnering with other entities, maybe you can partner with the state, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and make it a state park, or you can partner with the city parks and recreation department um, to put in trails and make sure that maybe you can share the uh, burden of maintaining the recreational space. So that was a pretty long and wordy answer there, but it's also something that now I'm um, interested in looking a little bit more into seeing the added cost of opening up these spaces to recreation. I think overall, the benefit outweighs the costs. Yeah, that's a really yeah. great example. Um, and of, of, of a, a source water protection program that has a lot of dimensions to it. Uh, so the next question, um, we are wondering in your research, have you, ha have you learned anything about what agencies are most active in source water protection and geographically where are they located and what are those agencies? Um, <clears throat> good question, yeah. So. Um, we do see that source water protection interest and source water protection participation can be quite regional. There are certain parts of the country that have uh, more of a water ethos than other parts of the country. I know that there, is, there are some parts of the country where <clears throat> it's politically difficult for these conservation programs to exist because it's seen as being counter to the economic development goal that many of these communities may have. Um, but specifically up in, um, Minnesota, there's watershed districts that have strong water ethos where there's a lot of participation um, actually for utilities and, and jurisdictions in the uh, Minnesota watershed districts, uh, participation is actually mandatory once the district is created. <clears throat> and uh, there are other places where watershed district participation may be voluntary. And so, um, <clears throat> It, it definitely does vary by region. Um, as far as the specific entities that participate in them, we always see land trusts and conservation groups being strong proponents of land conservation. But as I showed on the first uh, polling question or the second polling question and on some of the slides, land conservation is not the only method for water source protection. So there are other en entities like perhaps the river keepers. These are all nonprofits that I'm answering. Um, answering there might be for profits that participate as well. But the river keeper may be more of identifying point source pollutions and identifying other non-point source pollutions that may already be um, counter to regulation that already exists. So there may be an enforcement mechanism to, to end that type of pollution, whereas land conservation is <clears throat> sort of preventing 
those land uses from occurring in the first place. So um, there are there are definitely um, I think the the East Molokai uh, partnership that I mentioned is a good example where it shows the diverse stakeholder group where you've got private, you've got funders, you've got um, nonprofit, and you've got a water utility all participating in the same goal. Um, so again, that was a pretty wordy answer, but um, it's a question that uh, there's lots of different components I could go into. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the next question is switching gears a little bit. It's about agriculture. And the question is, do you know any practices that farmers generally use to protect watersheds? Um, and, you know, for example, do you know anything about the use of terracing? And are there other practices out there that you might be able to share with us? Sure. Um, so this is a question that I think that I would have to do slightly more research on to get into some of the specifics. But just in general, um, part of the Farm Bill funding and part of the funding for the, uh, the water, sorry, there was a W... Uh, the National you, Water Quality um, okay. yeah, um, is, is helping farmers institute uh, measures that are voluntary. Um, so providing perhaps incentives for maybe pay for performance, that type of thing, where they would incentivize farmers to participate where they otherwise might not participate. And so to get into the specific technology, I think maybe slightly beyond the scope of this webinar, but I'd certainly be willing to reach out to the individual and talk to them a little bit more um, about the specifics. Um, but just in general, there are practices that are both infrastructure and uh, non-infrastructure that may uh, influence water quality around agricultural land. So anything from no-till agriculture to making sure you're applying pesticides and fertilizers at the correct time, um, to uh, which direction you till the land in, um, making sure you're doing it parallel to waterways, to um, instituting buffers that uh, may be above what, what is required by law, but maybe you can work with a land mitigation bank uh, company or a nonprofit in order to provide um, yourself with a monetary benefit to institute in those larger buffers. So there's lots of things that agriculture can do. We do see that the agriculture initiatives are um, much more voluntary than initiatives for other entities. And so that provides a particular challenge because you have to figure, figure out ways to incentivize that with the, ag, uh, with the ag participants. But there is lots of opportunity because um, agriculture makes up for many of these small water systems such a large part of their watershed because they're not urbanized. Yeah, that's definitely a good overview of a topic that could be an entire webinar in and of itself, so thank you. Um, you had mentioned, this is another shifting gears again, but you had mentioned the example of the Catawba Watery and how mm -hmm. they were able to set up an allocation fee. Um, do you know anything else about that fee and do you think it was difficult for them to do that because it might have needed more buy-in? <clears throat> yeah, uh, so um, the the answer to both those questions is yes and yes. Um, so uh, the the fee itself uh, is interesting because there's both water utilities and a power company that are involved in the watery. And so the power company pays a, a large portion of that uh, total revenue for water allocation fees. And so the process itself, um, there was lots of revisions in the draft for the uh, Catawba Watery Master Plan. And originally, um, I believe it included a uh, water allocation fee that was uh, a little bit higher magnitude and, and included more for water quality. Um, but what they ended up coming to was a little bit less, um, but still had had that, that component where they're, they are paying to protect the source water, which is, I think, the main point is making sure you're doing something um, at all. At all. Um, and the, the Catawba Watery is a, is a nice example because these, these entities, they're all using the same source. Um, so they're all contributing to the same goal. They all benefit pretty much equally from uh, better water quality within uh, the Catawba watershed. So um, yeah, there were, there, were, there were multiple drafts leading up to the final draft. Um, so I'm sure there was lots of uh, pushback and I'm sure that they had to come to a compromise. And I think any sort of watershed um, allocation fee, any sort of water quality fee experiences that same pushback. 
Yeah, that certainly sounds like a complex process. But on that note, um, do you maybe have any advice for how to get started and reach out to form a partnership or an interlocal agreement or something along the lines that you've speak, spoken about over the course of the webinar? Maybe just from in general, how you might begin. Yeah, um, I think a good a good way to uh, to begin um, on looking for potential interlocal agreements to look at for, looking for potential partnerships is to identify people that may already share the same goal as you. Um, and so this may include um, identifying where individuals uh, may be withdrawn from the same water source, maybe from the same watershed, um, and maybe where interlocal agreements may already exist. Um, if you have a pre-existing relationship, if any part of your city or county government has a pre-existing relationship with other cities or counties or private entities, um, then you can e more easily build off a relationship that already exists then you can build off um, and you can create one from scratch. So maybe if you're already purchasing water from another entity, it may be a good good point to, to come to them to see how you may be able to uh, work together to protect the source water for, um, for your uh, customers. So identifying um, common ground, um, identifying um, relationships that already exist that can be built upon, um, and then also inspiring people who don't already participate by um, really pushing um, with public engagement, with customer education, the ancillary benefits that I mentioned um, in one of the slides here. Um, yeah, I was already on it. Um, the recreational ancillary benefits, the social ancillary benefits, economic, public health, and resiliency that may inspire people who don't already participate in source water protection to participate. And so that's where you're going to get the partnership with the nonprofits. Um, they're really interested in the land conservation. Um, the people who donate to nonprofits, like land trusts, are interested in having the recreation um, access to some of these lands that they may not otherwise have, um, where they can go and, and canoe on the on the reservoir, or they can go and camp on the shore. Um, so you just want to get at um, why people may care, um, and that would provide the basis that you can form that partnership on. Absolutely. Um, okay, so again, switching gears, you mentioned a tool called a consumer confidence report. Um, do you think you could tell us what kind of information typically goes into making one of those and, and remind us how it can help maybe start the process for source water protection? Yeah, um, so a consumer confidence report <clears throat> at its <clears throat> most basic uh, Description is just sharing with the customer what the what the utility knows about its system and what it knows about its source water. So even if the system is within compliance for contaminants that are regulated by the state agency, then um, sharing what level they're at and how they're testing for it, uh, letting the consumer know um, what kind of due diligence they're doing already to prevent um, source water contamination. Um, as far as the specifics for what is regulatorily required within a consumer confidence report, I'm not. Um, I'm, I'd have to do a little bit more research on on that before I speak to it on the webinar. Um, but um, just the consumer confidence report is something that the utility may already be doing that provides a platform for being transparent with the customer and just building that trust that is so important um, <clears throat> for the relationship between the customer and the utility. Awesome. Okay, so at this time, I want to remind, we did get a couple questions about the PowerPoint slides. So the answer to your questions about will the PowerPoint slides be available to attendees is yes. Um, we will, as soon as we can, get the slides uploaded to our website along with the recording, and we'll send out a link to that to the same email address that you use to register uh, for the webinar as soon as possible. So. We try to get that out to you pretty quickly. Um, and then another thing I wanted to mention is that we also have a short evaluation for our webinars that we would love it if you, were, if you would take it. You don't have to, but if you would like to, I'm gonna send that out in the chat now while we still have a few minutes if you wanna queue that up. Um, so you should be re receiving that in your chat box. And I think we do just have a couple more minutes for questions, um, maybe not a ton of time, but 
there are there are a couple more minutes, so if you have more questions, you can type those in, and we'll do our best to get to them. Um, so moving on, <laughs> back to back to more context appropriate questions. Um, this is a question about how do you find out what drainage basin you might be in if you don't know that yet. Oh, that, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, long story short, is you, you'd have to go to the uh, entity that has information um, for maybe geographic information systems, or you may already be within an entity that, or within a watershed where someone else in the watershed has a watershed plan. So, um, if you don't know that information yet, it's basically just to kind of perhaps ask around um, uh, and, and see if anyone else has delineated the watershed for you. Um, <clears throat> there are also uh, resources that may help you um, with that task. Uh, certainly state agencies would be more than willing to help if, if you, they know that the, um, the uh, inspiration for you asking that question is because you want to move forward with source water protection. I'm sure they'd go out of your way, go out of their way to help you with that task. Um, so it is a GIS question. It's a it's a geographic question. Um, so it's something that um, someone would have to answer who has access to that software if that answer doesn't already exist. Um, but it's something that um, I could even do myself uh, with a little bit of time and given the right data. So if that's something you have a question about, then you can reach out to me and I'll I'll help you find that answer as well. Yeah, and not to plug our technical assistance too much, but if that is something you need. Um, we do have experts like Evan who can help with that. So on that note, I think we've made it through almost all of the questions today. Uh, and we've sent out our survey. So I think at this point we can hand it back over to you, Evan, for any closing comments and get ourselves wrapped up. Yeah, uh, thanks everybody for attending today. Um, as Tess said, uh, there are uh, opportunities for technical assistance um, that we can provide uh, to answer any of your questions in a one-on-one -on -one format. Um, I'll be sure to bring a little bit of drinking water to that um, because I did have a bit of a scratch in my throat here. Um, but I'll be prepared for our phone conversation if you want to reach out to me. My contact information is here. You can you can also put in a form um, through the, the website, the EFC Network website uh, for technical assistance. And just contact anyone at the Environmental Finance Center uh, for any questions you have, and we can direct you to the right person. So uh, thanks so much for attending the webinar today, and um, I hope we helped answer some of these questions, maybe provided some inspiration for you. Um, and if you have any initiatives that you're participating in that you want to share with us that we could include in future webinars and future one-on-one uh, -on -one technical assistance, um, then we'd be, more, we'd be really excited to hear about those. I saw that in that polling question, people were already participating in partnerships. So. I'd love to hear about some of the specifics if you wanted to share those. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone um, and continuing the research in this area. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. And we hope to see you or hear from you at another webinar soon.